Hello, my name is Ipo Swords, and today I'm going to be doing a quick response video to the Welsh Viking on the topic of Damascus steel, which he recently posted a video on, and I thought warranted a tiny bit of elaboration. But before that, let me contextualize and introduce myself. My name is Ipo Swords. And beyond being a YouTuber who focuses on swords, I'm also the secretary of the International Woots Society, Woots being one of the names used to describe crucible steel. I'm also a collector of antiques, including a rather substantial number which are made of crucible steel, like the toolbar behind me, or several of the others I've featured on my channel. Beyond that, one of my photos was also used in his video, so we're going to be diving a little bit deeper into his video and seeing what issues might crop up. It is quite difficult to make because it involves basically blast furnaces, uh, or it involves the use of fluxes, so additional impurities like glass and sand, as well as melting um, cast iron. We're starting here with a claim which is partially correct. Crucible steel could be made with something like cast iron and wrought iron mixed together in a co-fusion process. However, it's not the only way it was made. It could also be made using something like wrought iron or bloomery steel and a direct carbon source like plant matter in a crucible, which is then brought up to liquidous temperature. This does not require a blast furnace and does not require cast iron. What it does require is for you to manage your carbon content by calculating the amount of plant matter rather than calculating the amount of carbon which is in your cast iron. Back in the day this would have been done in trial and error methods but these days we can pretty precisely estimate or even measure the amount of charcoal needed or carbon which is in our cast iron from which a crucible charge can be developed. And I'm going to get onto what I just mentioned a little later because the astute viewer might have noticed I said these days. There were people doing it and those people were in Asia and the Indian subcontinent is one of the places where we know that people were doing that. Uh, we know that they were making this amazing crucible steel and then that was being exported from Asia through various trade routes to places like uh, the Levant. We're now moving on to a little bit of geography, and I'd like to say that it goes beyond just Asia and the Indian subcontinent. Crucible steel was made in a variety of places, including, for example, Iran. In fact, there's a rather interesting variant of crucible steel that was made in Chahak, Iran, which even contained a small amount of chromium, which can have pretty substantial impacts on, for example, grain size and grain hardness in steels. So it's not just Asia and Southeast Asia that was producing this steel. And it's not just in the medieval period. The, the period for which crucible steel was made spans back from the 6th century BCE all the way up until like 1902 current era. We have a number of Islamic writers in the 9th, 10th and 11th centuries who write about Damascene steel. And again, this is partially correct. Islamic scholars did write about crucible steel, but they wrote about it using the proper terms. They called it fulad, and they called the pattern firind. And they also wrote about Damascene steels, but they didn't write about the two together. The Damascene steels they discussed and the fulad they discussed were not the same thing. They never discussed the Damascene swords as having a pattern because they weren't made of this crucible steel that formed a pattern. That in particular is at least what I've read from Al-Kindi and there might be other scholars who wrote about Damascus as having been Damascene and having a pattern but at least as far as Al-Kindi is concerned we don't see Damascene swords with a pattern. We see swords of a pattern and we see Damascene swords two separate things. What we have is this high carbon, very difficult to make because it involves quenching and then heating and quenching and then heating, very specific ways, um, 
hardened steel, this Damascus steel. Okay, now we get into something that's actually repeated a few times in the Welsh Vikings video. And that is the idea that this steel was heated up and then quenched multiple times in order to gain its pattern, and that's not correct. While it is thermally cycled, especially while forging, to aggregate the spheroids and create spheroids of cementite, that's not quenching. It just means bringing the blade up to forging temperature and then it cooling down again and either putting it back in the forge before it cools down too much or not. But you're not quenching it. That's a different process and it's done at the end. You don't do that repeatedly. It's actually been made in India for hundreds of years before the Viking Age even starts, so it's, it's a well-established trade. And yes, like the Welsh Viking says, the earliest examples we have are from Tamil Nadu, which is in present-day India, and they are from around the 6th century BCE, 500 CE-ish. I'm going to link a paper here, and I'm not going to butcher the pronunciation, so I'm not going to attempt them. But it describes a sword which was found in a, a burial area, which has all of the signs of being pattern-forming crucible steel. It's got cementite spheroids, it's got no slag, it is what we would expect, and it is from around, let's say, 500 to 300 BCE. So, so much for what Damascus steel actually was. It was this amazing material that wasn't being made in Europe, that was being imported. And yes, it, it does hold an edge very well, it does cut very, very cleanly. It's extremely strong stuff to make weapons out of, so it would be very good for making swords. This is a more minor point, but I dislike the concept that all Damascus steel, or rather hypotectoid pattern forming historical crucible steel swords, were of high quality. It varied dramatically. Some of them were cold short, meaning they would break very easily and become brittle in cold weather. Others were soft, they weren't hardened very much. Others had high sulfur amounts, so they were brittle regardless of temperature. Crucible steel was made in a lot of places, for a lot of times, with a lot of materials and a lot of different methods. Each ingot and each sword should be considered separate in terms of their material parameters. No two are really the same. So we see some that are flexible, some that are not flexible and will take a sec. We see some that are hard, some that are not hard, some that are differentially hardened. There is a huge range of patterns and of, of qualities of crucible steel, which was known historically. Certain areas were renowned for having better steel than others. If we go back to Al-Kindi, I'm pretty sure he wrote that Yemeni crucible steel was worth like a hundred times more than some Indian steels. The technique peters out after the medieval period. In fact, it peters out quite late in some areas. There is um, some evidence that it's still being made in India in the 18th and 19th centuries, and it's likely that the British Raj, the actual British Empire controlling India in that period, was stamping it out to an extent. Partly probably because there were taxes involved and partly just because they were awful people. And here's Another partially correct statement, yes, it did die out after the medieval period, but like 500 years after the medieval period. We still have first-hand accounts of it being made in 1841 in Bukhara or in 1902 in Sri Lanka and all the way in between then. It was being made, it's just in much lower quantities for a myriad of variety of reasons. It's not just one. It's not that they mined out a single ore source, or not that they ran out of ore, or not that it was just the British Raj that destroyed the production of crucible steel through, through the introduction of laws, through the prevention of mining, through the prevention of deforestation to make charcoal. There was a lot of reasons behind the collapse of the crucible steel industry, not least the fact that cheap European blades were being imported and out-competing the rather expensive and labour-intensive crucible steel. But what about Damascus steel now? Like I said, you could go on your phone now and Google Damascus steel knives, Damascus steel swords, and there will be hundreds and hundreds of them available for you to buy for, for a hundred quid or for a thousand quid. What are you actually buying? Are you buying this mysterious, legendary medieval metal? Quick answer, no. Long answer, no. 
And here we come to the big one. I said I'd get back to this, but people do make crucible steel in the modern day. I helped found a society to combat this precise problem where people think that crucible steel can no longer be made. They literally think it is a lost art. And that's wrong. Piggybacking on the work of, of Wadsworth and, and Pendre and Verhoeven, we have hundreds of people who can now make crucible steel and even in the size of a sword. I know people who've made crucible steel swords and I'm talking quite a few people. The same like 200 people I know of who make knives and swords in crucible steel. And this isn't some technicality, this is the same steel. It's got the same rafts of cementite spheroids that aggregate based on nucleation points that are determined by carbide forming elements that move into the intradendritic regions during ingot solidification in a crucible. This is the same crucible steel, it has the correct patterns, it has the correct material properties. We can make it today, we do make it today. I know people who've made Shamshir, who've made Karabela, who've made Kilich, who've even made Katana and Wakazashi blades from Crucible Steel. Yes, you're probably not going to find it for £500. You might find it for £1,000 or £2,000 or £10,000. But I can show you photos of people who've made these swords. I could put them under a microscope and find the same microstructures as the historical swords. We do make it today. What you're doing there is you're folding metal. What you're not doing is using a very specific kind of high carbon hyper eutectoid steel that has been produced with specific um, impurities that has been quenched and heated repeatedly in specific ways to get this specific hardness and quality of the metal. It is a, a very specific scientific method to make this original Damascus steel. On a lighter note, we're once again back to the claim that it was repeatedly quenched. It wasn't. There's a lot of different ways you can forge crucible steel. You can forge it above ACM or below ACM or keep it in a narrow band of temperatures for the entire time you're forging it. Or you can bring it up to temperature, forge it and then let it drop again. Or you can even do all of those things and then thermally cycle it 10 times before you quench it in order to fully spheroidize all of the carbon in the blade. But you don't repeatedly quench it. What pattern welding is, is folding metal. Which sounds very different because it is very different. But in the 1970s, some American blacksmiths uh, started experimenting with pattern welding, started to see very similar sort of striations and they thought, oh hey, this must be what Damascus steel was. It's just a type of pattern welding technique. And now we come to a pretty obvious point that yes, pattern welding is not crucible steel. They're different technologies using different materials with different outcomes, different physical properties, different microstructures, which can be differentiated under a microscope or with the naked eye if you know what you're looking for. And I agree, it's important not to conflate the two. Crucible steel and pattern welding are not the same thing. Using the word Damascus steel has both modernly and historically been used as a catch-all term, an umbrella term, for any patterned steel. Whether it gains that pattern through the precipitation of spheroid cementites, or whether it gains that pattern through the use of dissimilar steels that etch different colours. And personally, I think that we should refer to one of them as historical pattern forming hypotectoid crucible steel, and the other as pattern welding, but I recognize that's quite a mouthful and it's also not very good for marketing. So I know people are going to call it Damascus steel and I'm going to have to keep making these videos until I'm 100 years old. I hope I'm never 100 years old. Before I forget, there was a Russian technique and there is a Russian technique whose name I've forgotten, it's there, which is also basically Damascus steel. It's a very similar um, high carbon with specific additions like manganese, that sort of thing, vanadium has to be involved, and uh, heating and quenching, heating and quenching technique that was in use in Russia in the 17th century and I think has now been rediscovered. So, now we're talking about bulat. This probably comes from the Turkish polat, which probably comes from the Persian pulad, 
and all of them just mean pure steel, essentially. The etymology is a bit fuzzy. It goes into fulad in Arabic-speaking areas and pulad in Persian, and there's a, there's a bit of debate about which came first, but it was probably pulad, at least according to what I've read. But let's get back to bulat. The Russian bulat really came to prominence after 1841, when Captain Masalski went to Bukhara, Uzbekistan and observed its production. He wrote notes and sent them to Anasov, and Anasov, in Russia, in Zlatust, decided to start producing it en masse. And he did, and they still make bulat there now today. In fact, there's one really well-known maker of what I would call a TV static aesthetic style of crucible steel from Russia using bulat style recipes today, and I'll put some of his pictures on the screen now. It's not my cup of tea aesthetically, but it is crucible steel with a very strong and very obvious pattern. There will also be people out there who will say this is a Damascus steel sword when it's pattern welded because they conflate the two terms, because they think pattern welding equals Damascus steel because it, it looks watered, it looks like this wavy, watery steel with the layers in it. It's very difficult for the untrained eye, it's difficult for somebody without um, a microscope, without a scanning electron microscope, to tell if it is or it isn't Damascus steel. So you buy it from somebody, who's to say it's not Damascus steel? And again, we're talking about the conflation of the terms. Now, I'd like to go into detail a little. It's not just modernly that we conflate the terms. Yes, Moran started in the 70s referring to pattern welding as Damascus, but he's not the first. Back as far as oh, 1800, you can find sabers in pattern welded steel with the label Damascus steel or Damastal on them. You can see gun barrels made of pattern welded steel which was wrapped around a mandrel and forged out labeled Damascus steel on the guns, in the catalogues, from the, the furnishers that sold them. It's not a new thing to wrongly refer to both of these categories of steel by the same name. It's a generic catch-all term which has been used to refer to any pattern steel for a really long time by people who don't know any better. And here we are using one of my photos. And I will say photos, not micrographs. Because while the Welsh Viking is saying you need a microscope to see it, you don't. I took this with a regular camera. Yes, modified to use an extreme macro lens, but a regular camera. I used a helicoid adapter in order to reduce the focal distance, and then I used a, a 50mm lens, and I could get it about a centimetre away from the blade and still in focus. What you're looking at here are spheroid cementites in rafts. And those rafts correlate to areas that are rich in carbide-forming elements. Those carbide-forming elements segregate out because they have a different dissolution temperature to all of the other things in the steel. And therefore, they get trapped in these rafts. And when you draw out the blade, you still have these remnants of these, these high concentration areas throughout the blade where carbide-forming elements can be found. When you then thermally cycle the blade again and again, each of those carbide forming elements acts as a nucleation point. And at these nucleation points, something called Oswald ripening occurs. And that refers to the successive aggregation of carbides onto these nucleation points that then become bigger and bigger and bigger spheroids until they're visible with the naked eye, not just a microscope. If you know what you're looking for, you can identify crucible steel with the naked eye. I've done it, I do it, and I will continue to do it, and there are others who can as well. All it requires is knowing what you're looking for. Understanding the metallurgy means you won't get caught out thinking something is crucible steel when it is in fact pattern welded. If somebody is selling you a sword for £500 and says that it is Damascus steel, you're going to want to make absolutely sure that that swordsmith has made that sword using these genuinely ancient techniques. Because chances are they haven't. So, here, let me give you two concrete examples. Actually, no, three. 
The first is a Shamshir sold several years ago as a Bear Blade by Peter Burt. As a side note, he's also a co-founder of the International Wood Society. And here you can see it has the correct patterning, it's made of the correct steel, it is a modern crucible steel Shamshir, and I'm pretty sure it sold for something like 900 US dollars for the Bear Blade. Not that crazy. Here we have a Carabella by Mert Tanzu. Oh, wait, no, he's also a member of the International Wood Society and a co-founder. What a coincidence. And now we have a sword by Kilich Osman Baskert in the style of a Kilich. What a surprise, it's in his name. But it's also made of crucible steel and it also has the historical patterns. All of these people and many, many, many more are making historically accurate crucible steel with the correct chemistry and the correct patterns. It's not a lost art, you can buy it today, and some of them have even sold on Etsy. I understand what you're trying to do with this History Matters series, to educate people about the fact that crucible steel and pattern welded steel are two different things. But in the course of trying to explain that, you've propagated other myths, you've perpetuated the idea it's a lost art. And I recognise it's really hard to find good sources on this topic, which is why, on the one hand, I helped form a society which is trying to do an entire course on crucible steel history and metallurgy, and also why I have this, like, 6,000 word write-up linked here that you can read that one day I'll make into a video. But it should give you a quick and brief basis on what crucible steel is, what it isn't, how it performs, and its history. Now, I recognize that I'm a tiny channel, especially in comparison to some of the others involved in this series. But I would caution you that just because someone has a large channel doesn't mean they're right. Just a couple of weeks ago, I think it was Side Projects made a video that also completely mischaracterized Crucible Steel. And before that, there was SciShow making incorrect claims about Crucible Steel, and hell, I even have this clip from a documentary of someone who works in a museum talking about cru a crucible steel sword. He's showing us a beautiful shamshir. See, this is a typical good quality sword of the Middle East. The light gray is low carbon steel, which is, uh, tends to be softer and more flexible. And the darker gray is high carbon steel. So by folding the two together, you have a blade which is at the same time flexible, but incredibly sharp. And saying it's pattern welded when it's not. So even experts get this wrong, but maybe try not to when you're making a video to educate people. That's all I've got for you today. Until next time, stay sharp.